Okay, my friends, Roger once again, and as we proceed forward in life, Mud Fossil University physics theories are being well proven. Now, what am I talking about today? We're talking about how to make a mini hydrogen generator. Well, what is a hydrogen generator? Hydrogen is called HHO gas. All you're doing is taking water and making it, breaking it apart. And what is water made out of? H2, so it's two parts H and O. So we're going to end up with an HHO gas. It's extremely combustible. And it's very simple to make. Now, this guy here, Roman Ershik, he actually shows you how to make them. I mean, it's very simple to make. It's a simple device. Now, he, he goes ahead and drills holes and puts all these things. See this? And then he puts all these screws through the holes and he gets them in a condition like this and then he puts all a connector here and a conductor here which separates these two and the electricity goes back and forth in between these and it spits out hydrogen you'll see in a second now and he solders the th things all the way across all right and he does all this and that and then he puts it inside uh he makes a, a gas collector tube. You should come up and watch this. But the, basically it goes in here and he puts salt water in here. Now, salt water from the ocean is much better than salt water from, you know, your regular crystallized salt. Ends up with this in the salt water. This tube, the gas comes under here and it goes into the tube. Well, it actually comes up over and into the tube to collect the gas. And here he is running it. Let's watch here. You see it? it that's, that's hydrogen gas coming. All those bubbles are creating in a very explosive gas. And the reason it's doing that is the electricity. See, that's where the gas is being collected. The electricity is literally breaking the... Let me see if I can... Put it. He's, he sucked the gas out of there and he's putting them in soap bubbles. Pow! Now, did that explode or did that implode? Close. I know what it did, and you will in a second too. Sounds like it exploded, right? Well, let's just see about that. Okay, now we have another guy, Oki Majori. He's igniting HHO gas. That's the water turned into gas. Now, does it explode or does it implode? Well, everyone knows an explosion. They, oops. Well, that was almost an explosion right there. It goes outwards. Poof. An implosion crushes itself inwards. Now, why would the thing that we just saw popping be crushing itself inwards? Well, let's see. Now, this guy's got an HHO developer here, and he's taken a bottle. And he's going to fill this bottle with HHO gas. All right, the very explosive gas. All right, so he's got it, and he's taking the bottle with him, and he's going down his hallway here, and he's going to put it in this. And this has a spark um, creator here. So he's got, it, he's got the gas in the plastic bottle. He's got it capped off. It's loaded with gas. That cap goes inside and there's a little filament in there, just like a light bulb. And he's going to put electricity across there. The filament will kick off inside. It'll explode or implode. What do you think? What do you think is going to happen? You think the bucket of water will explode? Or it will crush the bottle inside of itself? Let's see what happens. No, I have it turned way down, I think. Yes, I do. Now, let me find where we want to look for, because it takes a while to get there. All right, here we go. Now, here we are. So, he's got it wired up, ready to go. Fire in the hole. Here it goes. Now, I got to run at its way, way, way slower speed. Boom. Did you see what happened? It was instantaneous, extremely bright. Let me see if I can get it back to where it's going to be extremely bright. 
Oops, oh boy, it's so quick. That's the key. It's so insanely fast, and it's so insanely, see it down here? Absolutely insanely bright. There it is. Look at that. Look at that. Now, so what are we seeing? Well, it looks like an explosion to me. The only thing is, it's not an explosion. All it is is like turning the light bulb on. You see that? That's all it did. And look what happened a second later. And it was a second later. It wasn't instantaneously. Right? It pops and then it collapses. Now, let's go back here. There's the explosion. Boom, watch. Boom, there it goes. Now, why that slow reaction, first of all? And why did it make the whole damn thing explode? Well, we're going to talk about it. All right, this is, uh, well, the holy grail of clean energy is fusion. Now, this is the new electron flood theory uh, atom model. So it's a new atomic model. Why is it different? The core is no longer made up of giant protons and neutrons. It is made up of particles that are the same particles that float around in the orbits. We'll call them still electrons. However, these electrons are dipoles. They have a positive and a negative end. They're tiny little ball zones of positive and negativity, just like a little tiny magnet like this, like these little magnets. And they glue together until they hit a certain frequency, which is a quantity. It's not a frequency necessarily. I'm not going to call it frequency. I'm going to call it quantity. It hits resonance quantity of 1836, which is a proton. That's what they call a proton. All it means is it's an assemblage of electrons into flooded into stability. Then when you add another few here and there, you end up with instability called isotopes. When you break them in big chunks, you have radioactive hand grenades. I mean, the bigger they get, the slammier they get. That's all it is. So you go up through ultraviolet into X-rays and gamma rays and, and then nuclear radiation. So my core is a bazillion little balls like that. Every proton has 1,836 of them. So there is a ton of particles within every single nuclear core. It's not just hydrogen has one of these gigantic protons that has the same voltage, it's opposite, but it's exactly the same as an electron, which is 1836 times smaller. Not correct whatsoever. They are all the same particle. They flood until they reach this zone of stability, this island of stability, but between every island of stability, there is a, a bazillion different locations that these electrons can fall into that are extra. They're called isotopes in nuclear particles. So, let's talk about what water is. Okay, we're going to start with the discussion of what water is and why it does these things that it does. Now, hydrogen is, there's two parts of hydrogen and one part of oxygen. It's H2O. So H, there's two of these. Each one of them has a, a nuclear part, which is 1836 of these, which is the electron part. So let's just say that's true. And there's two of these. And they would like to, the, the most they can have is two electrons in their lower orbital. We'll talk about that later. Then you have your oxygen. Oxygen has eight electrons. Two are in the lowest orbital and then six go in the valence shell. Two additional slots are there. And guess what we have? Two additional hydrogens here because we have two, I mean two different electrons because we have two different hydrogens. But they own those electrons. What's going to happen? Well, they could share. So here's your hydrogen. 
There's your core hydrogen, see? That's the nucleus. There's the other nucleus. What is it doing with its electrons? Not that it had one. Well, it's got one over here, and it's sharing one of that guy's. This one here has one of its, and it's sharing with this one. So it's actually taken the in-between, which is just enough to satisfy that voltage. This, the oxygen, moves some of its electrons over to deal with the hydrogens. So the hydrogen nucleus lays way off to the side and the negativeness stays over here. So you end up with a highly polar molecule. Your positives, which are the nucleuses of the hydrogen, make your positive end. So this becomes more or less like a bar magnet. You have a negative and you have a positive. So let's assume we have bar magnets. And here they are right here. All right, so they will stick together, and they will just keep, and they'll go until a point, and it appears it's 1836. I cannot tell you why. But at 1836, they say, we don't want any more. That's it. We're done. We're all glued together as perfect as we're going to get. And here we are. There's 1836 of us. And then some more try to come in. And they will allow one or two or so, who knows how many. But at some point, they will say, no, absolutely no more. And then what happens? What happens then is this. They go into their literally trying to get into that core. Now, do they spin around like that? I, not normally, I wouldn't think. But they might. Now, why would they skip spin around like that? Well, because other people are trying to invade their space. There's, there's a ball here. There's a ball here. And then there's all these things floating in between them. And all you've got to do is jiggle a little anybody's, <laughs> anybody's balls. And you're going you're gonna to move a lot of electrons. It's just the way it works. Anyway. Um, okay, my friends. These are transition metals. And they occur in nature, obviously. And, and they occur in the body, in the blood. I will show this quite clearly in a second. The thing that I want to point out to you is that they use bacteria and different enzymes, I believe, in water treatment plants to harvest metals, heavy metals. And a lot of them could be transition metals, chromium and vanadium and titanium, things like that. And things that, you know, lead and so forth. And that's, it's done by bacteria and it's done by chemistry. And the chemistry is created by the bacteria. They make enzymes. Enzymes deal with these as molecules. The enzymes are not alive. They're not alive, so they're not going to get killed by these things. All right? So they are enzymes that do the chemistry to make these things attach to something else or break down or do whatever they are designed to do in a creature. Now let's move one step forward. Now, these transition metal complexes, I'm going to show you, are floating through the blood. And you see these pluses and all these things? They attach to other, other molecules, and they can give and take very easily. They are complexes. The metal is in the center, and it's surrounded by what they call ligands. Those ligands are attachments that it sort of holds on to things and carries them around your body. And I'll show you where I can prove that by this. Okay, it doesn't get any more clear than this. Now, a couple takeaways here. One of them is all of these little reds and blues and greens and all these different little shades of colors are transition metals. They are floating freely in the blood everywhere. Now, that's takeaway number one. We know that blood circulates through the body. These are the carriers of particles. That's what they do. Metal complexes. It's quite well understood.
Now, in addition, we can see like this is the chamber, the heart chamber. And w why is it this specific color? And these are, I believe, the heart strings, and this is the walls of the, the ventricle walls. Now, this specific color means that there's a molecule in here that is has that specific color, means it has that specific chemistry that creates that color. These colors are created by chemistry. They're not there by accident. Nobody painted them. They are chemicals. What they like? This is the blood. The red is the blood. You know, it's iron rich. Um, anyway, if you could put a endoscope with a um, X-ray um, microscope in there, that um, a fluoroscope that could actually see these tissues when you're alive and tell what the molecular com you know combinations are in here you could tell like you I think this was a heart attack you see that that looks to me like a dead spot in the guy's heart that would be right over here it might not be a dead spot it might be an entry or an exit or I don't know what but yeah it's probably I don't know that's probably the aorta error or something like that. Who knows? But what I'm getting at is you could tell all this stuff by having something go in there and look and see. Whoop, 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 this is a orange instead of blue in this spot. Or up here. You know, I don't know. Maybe this was a heart attack. I have no clue. But this is an opalized heart. It's got the all the things that I just talked about. Transition metals. The tissue is specific with specific chemistry. There's a lot we can learn from this. Just so you can make a comparison, I believe this is uh, that spot that I said maybe there's damage. I don't know. This guy had some kind of thing going on. I'm just using this to show what a heart is. And these are the heart strings. And some of this tissue might be damaged and you might know by using an x-ray fluoroscope in there and and seeing what that chemistry actually is